Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Linda, and I'm originally from Michigan, now living in the St. Louis metro area. I'm a college coach with School Match for You and have a daughter at University of Chicago. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHealthToday.com. And Joy has a bachelor's degree from the University of Georgia and a master's degree from North Carolina State University. She works in private practice in Raleigh as a mental health therapist. And I'm so blessed to be able to work alongside both my beautiful daughters at School Match for You, a college counseling firm that I founded in 2010. Good morning, friends. I'm very excited about today's episode, The Big 360. Uh, something just happened to me in a counseling session I was in with one of my South Florida families. And I said, pump the brake, stuck. Let's include that in the episode. So I'm adding something I wasn't planning on adding. And you're going to have to listen to find out what it is. And then I'm going to continue sharing some insights from the session I attended with Emery and Washu and Rice and Cornell and Pomona, where there was a deep discussion about school profiles. We're going to talk about what are school profiles, why are they important, and what do colleges like to see in a school profile. And then we will continue with part two of three with Lisa's excellent interview with Brian Burgess, the executive director of Delta Theta Chi. We're talking all things fraternities. I had a listener reach out to me and send a text and say, hey, I was a member of Delta Theta Chi. Great place. Enjoyed the interview. Let's start out by talking with what just happened to me in this session. Well, you know, I'm always sharing with you that we learned so much from the families that we work with. And today was no exception. And so... um I don't normally do something like this. What I'm going to share with you is not been verified, has not been substantiated. But one of the reasons why I'm sharing it with you is to see if amongst all of us, um, somebody can provide a little more intel and see if I can substantiate it. So we have talked in the past about the concept of yield protection. And um, just to give a review in case anybody didn't miss those episodes, Yield is a term that's used to refer to the percentage of admits that enroll. Yield. So what is yield protection? Well, yield protection involves schools not admitting completely acceptable, admissible, even very desirable applicants simply because they think there's a low probability the student will come. And so they're trying to manage their yield, but they're also really trying to protect their acceptance rate. So... You know, it's really, we call it your protection, but you could also call it uh, acceptance rate protection as well. And, you know, it's based off of the premise that if a school has reason to believe there's a really low chance that an applicant will come, why waste an acceptance on that person? Um, not only will it decrease your yield, it will increase your acceptance rate and for, you're not getting anything out of it. And the problem with this is it makes it very difficult to build a college list. Because when you build a college list, you want to have, you know, balance on your list. And you think you've identified some colleges that you're highly likely to be admitted at because either your student, if it's a parent or the student itself, knows that their their profile is stronger than the average kid they admit. But then the college turns around and doesn't admit you. It happens all the time. Um, although, once again, nuance is important. There are schools that don't do it at all. And this is one reason why... Uh, there was a time I was comfortable with my students having two colleges on their list that were high likelies or high probable schools, 90% or higher admit chance of admission, not 90% acceptance rate, just um, my own assessment from my experience of what their chances of admission would be. And now I've upped that to three. I want all my, all my students to have three schools. 
not just on their list, but they would that they would be happy to go to. And that's really important. A lot of times they just throw them on just because they need to please you or please parents. No, three that you'd be happy to go to. I understand they're probably not your aspirational school. I get that. I'm not asking you to be a robot and think you're going to love them all equally, but that you realize I could get a great education and I could have a great experience. So all the schools that I'm aware of that do yield protection are private schools. I have yet to have a school admit to me a public school that they do yield protection, although some stuff coming out of the University of Michigan has really made me wonder about that. But so what happened today in this counseling session? So I'm I'm meeting with a family and they tell me about a couple good friends of theirs that attend a, a very highly regarded independent school, which I'm not going to mention names here, but it's just a highly regarded independent school that sends a boatload of kids to the University of Florida. And the family I'm working with is very close with this family. So their counseling office told this family that their son should not submit his 1520 on the SAT. He had a 1470 or 1490, either 1470 or 1490 originally, and now he got a 1520. And this counseling office is very highly regarded school that sends a bunch of kids to the University of Florida, says the University of Florida practices yield protection, and they might wait list you uh, or technically defer you to the regular round because they don't think you'll come. Whereas you're okay with your high 1400 score. Why am I sharing this? Especially when it's not substantiated. I mean, this is going from my client telling me what their very good friends told them that their school counselor. So it's a couple of steps removed from direct firsthand knowledge, right? And I also haven't heard from the college itself. Well, I'm telling for a couple of reasons. I've been trying to do research to find out what public schools are practicing yield protection. I see it a lot with independent or private schools. And this could be a case. Don't take it to the bank. Hear what I said. Two levels removed from direct knowledge. Why share it? Because I want to see if anybody else here has any intel, either on the University of Florida or other public schools that intentionally defer or waitlist a student that they think will not come to practice yield protection or acceptance rate protection. Like I said, I have long suspected a number of public schools to do it, but I haven't been able to confirm. I plan on talking to the University of Florida about this and hear directly from the horse's mouth. Um, you know, they have not shied away for the fact that interest is one thing that plays a role in their holistic review. But if anybody has any information out there on that, please share it. Questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Um, send us an email. And it's very interesting, though. And I don't mean to complicate things for people who are working on list building. But I do want you to be aware that this happens. You know, this wasn't a family I worked with this year, but uh, somebody I know did. And I found out that they did not get in George Washington, but got in Harvard. I suspect it right away what was going on, yield protection. Um, but that's a that's a private school. I see it there rather frequently. Um, but any I'm going to have any intel, please share it. And I also wanted you guys to be cognizant of the fact that this goes on. So you're also getting a tip out of it. Make sure you have at least three probables or likelies on your student's list um, just as insurance and protection and not just on there, but ones you'd be happy to go to. All right. That's it on that. Uh, I plan on coming back when I get more information. I can be like a dog chasing a bone. So when something like this intrigues me, I don't quit until I get an answer. And so ultimately I need to have a conversation with the University of Florida. Um, but in the interim, I'm trying to get information on them and any other public school that is passing over perfectly admissible kids just because they don't think they'll yield them. All right. The next thing I want to share is the session that I attended last week. And 
why am I talking about school profiles? What are school profiles? And what do I recommend for school profiles? You know, I also went back and forth on sharing this because in some ways this is insider talk, right? So I was at a session, if you never heard last week's episode, you know, with Emery Cornell, Rice, Washu, and Pomona, four counselors, mostly all were school-based counselors. So after they all did their spiel and we went into Q&A, um, somebody asked the question for advice on school profiles and one of the representatives said, am I ever glad you asked this? So school profile provides a lot of incredibly helpful information about a high school so that admission officers can read applications in context. They can take into consideration a multiplicity of factors if they know the unique um, idiosyncrasies of your school. So they're very important. In fact, um, I'm not sure if Susan remembers this, but one uh, Susan asked me at one point, Mark, I'm thinking about uh, revising our school profile. Would you like to work with me on this project? And the idea is that we would reach out to you know 50 or so colleges for feedback, ask, ask them to give us give feedback on our school profile, and then make some changes. And I love stuff like that. And I can't remember why I never ended up doing it because I remember being really excited that she asked me to do it. I personally thought we had one of the best ones um, that I'd seen anywhere, but I just loved how Susan was just trying to get any insight at all from any colleges or anything we're missing um, that we could use to improve. So admission officers feel very strongly about school profiles because when a school has a very bad profile, you're putting your applicants at, at a disadvantage. And, you know, part of me said, well, why am I sharing this mostly to a group of parents? Well, I thought, for one, we have a lot of parents who are very involved in their schools, and they may be able to play a role in getting their school profile changed. We have a lot of college counselors who listen, school-based, you see the questions they send in. And we just have a lot of curious people about how college admissions works. So I'm hoping this isn't boring because um, most of you are not in a decision maker status to be able to change the profile. It is what it is for your school. But even so, I thought you would appreciate having uh, more insight into what makes for a really good school profile. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share some of the things that the five different admission officers shared were very important to them in a school profile. And then I'm going to share some additional things as well. And I'll even share some of the things that are extremely important to me. You know, Susan and I were talking maybe a year, year, year and a half ago, and we were talking about how we cannot do our job without a school profile. Not well. We can't interpret it. We can't interpret a transcript without a school profile. It's just essential tool in our toolkit in order to effectively list build. So, I'm not going to name names here, but I'm just going to um, tell you some of the things that the counselors emphasized. Well, one of the parts that was interesting was a debate emerged as to how long the profile should be. Uh, one of the representatives likes a longer profile, uh, but one of the other representatives chimed in very, very vociferously and said, I promise you I'm not reading anything after the third page. So please, enough with these 10-page school profiles. And I would say most of the five agreed with that voice. Um, and one person was more of an outlier on liking something longer than that. So if you're involved in devising them, I really would limit it to three. Um, another person said, don't make it color-coded because some of us are colorblind. Um, another person said, please get rid of all the images. They take up so much room and space, and we're trying to read through apps quickly. Another one said, a little bit of history of your school is okay, but please don't overboard on too much his history on your school. Now, another interesting debate emerged. This is I'm, I'm partly sharing this with you because I do want you to see that not everybody agrees on everything, and different admission officers have different perspectives. One representative said, 
I don't like it when schools list all the colleges that their kids attended. Um, it's just, you know, we don't need that. You know, you're, it's filler. It's wasting time and space. Where another representative said, I vehemently disagree. That helps me a lot, especially if it's a new school, to understand where their kids are going. I personally will chime in and tell you I find it helpful. So that's something I, I agree on the one side on that. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a second as well. One person said, it's clear that not all of you are devising profiles just for us. You're using it for marketing a number of purposes, but I really recommend you have a designated profile exclusively thinking of college admission officers and customize it and customize it to our needs. One representative said, it's so helpful to know what your counseling load is. Do you have 10 students or do you have 500? That helps me immensely to know that. Another representative said, it's really helpful for me to know the percentage of kids coming from your immediate zip code, or are you drawing from like 80 zip codes? Knowing the context of your school is really important. Another person said, having a grade distribution is very helpful. And everybody chimed in and agreed on that. Now, let me say this. When I look at a school profile, I'm really looking for a grade distribution. And I'm also really looking at your grading scale. I want to know, is a 94 an A or is a 90 an A? That's a big difference. Got to have your grading scale and a grade distribution and... um. I really like this because the, the one we had at West Town that Susan was responsible for had this, and most schools don't have it. What it will do is it would tell you if there were 17 students in a class, it will tell you how many got A's, how many got B's, how many got C's. That is immensely helpful, immensely helpful, even if it's just for your AP classes, your advanced classes, or even if it's just for like 11th and 12th grade classes. Grade distributions, very, very helpful. Another person talked about having the two and four year college going rates is very important for us to see the college going context of the school. What percentage of students are going to two year schools, going to four year schools? Another person said, um, it's very helpful to know the number of students that are getting financial aid if it is an independent or a private school. So those were some of the things that counselors chimed in in the Q&A session. But I'm going to share some more things that are really helpful. And some of this comes from the college board who produced a really good guideline on school profiles. So having your school name, phone number, and website URL, very helpful. Um, having phone numbers and email addresses for all college counselors and the principal, very helpful. School directions and preferred times for college visits. And nowadays, so much of the college visits are done online. And so if, if you're using one of the various websites out there for scheduling, having that information clearly marked. Having your SIEB code, very important to have that because that's, you know, commonly used, your SIEB code, S-C-E-E-B, which stands for College Entrance Examination Board Code. Really helpful. Another thing that is helpful to know is any, your mission statement. If you're a school with admission or if you're an independent school, what are your admissions guidelines? Major employers in the area, educational level of parents, and then any accredited member memberships. Now, <laughs> I'm not done, and I forgot something that the counselors from, from Emory, Rice, Cornell, Washington, and Pomona said. Get rid of the nine font. Please, no nine font. Okay? So uh, it's challenging to pack a lot of this information in, not be over three pages, and not have your font be too small. That is challenging. That's probably the only thing I can think of I didn't like about the profile we had is we had some small font, but it's hard to do that great distribution with details and not have small font. So it's a kind of tricky dilemma. Um, curriculum information, really, really important. 
you know, the availability of your academic programs, any unique or special curriculum you have. Some schools have different things. Like we had senior projects, kind of like were capstone projects that students would do. Another thing we had, I'm talking about when I was at West Town working with Susan. In our U.S. history class, students spent two weeks in the archives doing master's level research because we had our own archives because the school was founded in 1799. So when it came to U.S. history, you could literally go down like you were a master's level history student and do original research. So those would be like a couple of the unique uh, features that we had. And if your school has any of those kinds of things, you want to make sure you have them. Special diplomas, tracks, any trackings that you have. Obviously, the list of your AP or honors or advanced courses that are offered, that's really important that it's on. And if you're an independent or private school, what are your enrollment policies um, to get into the school or to get into like AP courses or on a course? Do you require a certain grade to get in or is it just a recommendation of a previous teacher or is it open to anybody? Uh, that kind of information can be really important. Graduation requirements, another thing. When it comes to grading and ranking, explaining your weighting system, that's extremely important. You know, we have this really weird thing here in Fulton County, where I live. The public schools, if you take an honors course, they add seven points onto your grade point average. So an 83 in an honors course, you see a 90. Well, we have the Hope Scholarship here in Georgia, and they don't do that. So if I'm ever working with somebody from this area, sometimes I have to break the bad news to them that your GPA is not as high as you think it is the way HOPE is going to calculate the HOPE scholarship because it's not going to put those seven points of weighting in when it calcul calculates your grade point average. And so explaining your weighting system is really important. When it comes to test scores, now this is something I really like a lot, uh, percentage of students that take the SAT and the ACT, and then a distribution. I find a distribution extremely helpful. How many people get um, certain score ranges? You know, I know uh, some years for my own company, I produced this. So you can see scores broken down by number of kids over 1,500 on an SAT, 14 to 1,500, 13 to 14, 12 to 13, 11 to 12, 1,000 to 1,100, under 1,000. And then we do 34 to 36 ACT, 30 to 33, 27 to 29, 24 to 26, that whole thing. That's very helpful, having a distribution of scores. And something I find really helpful, and I love it when I see this on a profile, is an AP test distribution. Very helpful. So I can see the, the percentage of fives, fours, and threes. And it's even better if it's by class. Another thing that sometimes schools produce that I really like a lot when I'm looking at a profile, and some of the stuff I'm sharing with you, by the way, doesn't come from the College Board. I'm kind of mixing some things from them just with some additional things I like. Some schools will break down, um, they won't give you a ranking, but they'll break down GPAs by quintiles, deciles, or quartiles. I find that very helpful. So I can see like the top 10%, this was the GPA, or the top um, quintile, the top fifth, or broken down into fifths, what the GPA ranges were, um, or quartiles. Very, very helpful, because it allows me to put a school in context. A per, sorry, allows me to put a student in context. And then... For college attendance history, I personally find it helpful. Um, what I don't find helpful is when schools just have a list of these were the schools that kids were accepted at. That doesn't do anything for me. Okay, and I get it. That's a marketing ploy. I've been a part of that kind of stuff before. I used to de design. I designed our own profile on the admissions side. So we had an admissions profile that was different from our official college counseling profile. And I was responsible for designing that. Yeah, I did that. I listed all the schools in bold where we had two or more kids admit it. And the ones are not in bold, I, you know, were just individual students. But I actually find it helpful what Susan did for our college profile, where you could actually see the numbers, numbers of kids. And we did it over a five-year range, which I think is a good range because you can always have outliers with one or two years. So I personally find that really helpful. And a lot of times like you can see trends and you can learn about a school by seeing similarities in the kinds of uh, places where kids go. So I did vehemently disagree with the rep that said that they didn't find uh, college history uh, helpful. I personally find it very helpful, but not just when you 
give me this long list and you say, here's all the places people were accepted with over the last 10 years. That means nothing. Give me some detail. Give me numbers and give me a time frame. Um, I'm okay with you saying here's where they were admitted as well as where they attended. I actually like that. Um, that's how we did it when I devised the one on the admission side. But that information is helpful. Um, extracurricular opportunities, sports that students can participate in. That's helpful to know. And then um, any grading changes that have occurred or changes in policies, maybe you used to rank and now you don't rank. That kind of information is, is very, very, very helpful. So anyway, I just thought that this might be helpful for you if you're intellectually curious about this topic or if you're in a position either as a school counselor or an active parent where you can have some say. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Okay, friends, it's time for part two of Lisa's interview with Brian Burchess, the executive director of Delta Theta Chi. So the episode started with me talking about a listener sharing that two of their very good friends have told them that their counselor at this well-regarded school that sends lots of kids to UF is practicing yield protection and they're deferring or waitlisting kids they get in the really high test score range that they don't think they're likely to come. That's how, a, uh, actually that person's not a podcast listener, but that's an example of how just feedback from, from parents and families helps this podcast. I bring it up again because the reason why we're having this segment with Brian Birches is because a listener wrote in and said, I'm loving your podcast, but I'm looking at your back catalog. I'm not seeing a lot on fraternities, sororities. And I was like, snap, she's absolutely right. And I immediately put it out to our co-host text message group. And thanks to Kevin Newton, he is friends with Brian Burgess. And so that's kind of how we all work to support each other, you know, by you sharing and we're just trying to scratch where you're itching. And so if we don't know we're itching, we can't scratch where you're itching. So it's always helpful when you can share any content that you're not getting from us that you want to get more of um, or content you're getting from us and you'd like more of it. Or to be honest, content you're getting too much of. That's also helpful. I learned a long time ago, let your critics be your unpaid counselors. You can pay big mucks to hire a consultant. Or you can learn from criticism about ways to improve. And that's what we're trying to do. So hopefully you'll enjoy Lisa's interview with Brian Burchess, part two. Yeah, I think that's a really excellent point. And I'm intrigued by your assessment of, you know, sort of the unhealthy aspects of our society when it comes to, I guess, higher education and maybe socializing. What, what kind of do you see as the main issues there? Hmm. Would you be able to reframe that question in a different way? Because I, I want to make sure that I understand. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now you're making me think. Um, I, I guess what I'm saying is you mentioned, um, you know, the quote of like adjust, being well adjusted to something that is pathological is not healthy. And um, I'm paraphrasing there. And I guess I'm wondering, you know, when you refer to like the problems higher up in our society about higher education, and I'm assuming that is maybe about like parties and drinking and drug use and social life. I'm just wondering what kind of you see you know, somebody sort of on the ground in this every day, what you see as the main issues um, that are pathological about higher education? I would say if you're looking at Kohlberg's stages of morality, that's probably uh, a model that I look at in reference to why people do good things or choose to do good things. And the lowest reasons why people would do it is fear and reward. And I think that our society, higher education, you know, my organization, I would say, is also a part of this. And, and we're redefining how we do business. You know, it's focused on the carrot and stick. And it's funny because we talk about carrot and stick in society quite a bit. And the genesis of that is sheep, right? It's banging sticks behind the sheep and holding carrots out in front of them. And, and quite frankly, we talk about 
if you if you go into pro- political realm, sheeple. Uh, you know, we're trying to control people and, and controlled motivation. If you're looking at self-determination theory, controlled motivation is not it's it's effective to some degree, but it's not it's not the best way to go. Autonomous motivation is and Edward D.G. Uh, did some research on that and, and it's phenomenal. Uh, and, and if you tie that back to Kohlberg stages of morality, there are higher levels. So level three on Kohlberg stages is to make someone else happy. So you can focus on your parents or uh, loved ones or friends, you, you know, in order to help them understand. And that's sometimes if you look at that, that is also why they do bad things, right? To make someone else happy. They want to be accepted and loved, right? At the core of everything we are, we just want to be loved as humans. Then level four, it's a rule. Institutions are really good at creating rules. They focus on bureaucracy, uh, which I would jump off and say there are three sides to an organization. There's bureaucracy, culture, and leadership. And and they they focus on like a deficit model. They're constantly giving training in areas that are considered the stereotypical challenges. So if you're only talking about sexual assault, hazing, and alcohol use, alcohol and drug use, then that's the behavior that you're expecting from your people. So you also have to set trainings for positive things to help people understand what they can replace it with. Then (laughs) you go up in the stages and it's, it's the right thing to do and it's a part of you, right? The self-actualization, you're not thinking about it anymore. So my goal within our organization is to really focus on what can we do to help you to think about the right decision and make the right decision. And then when you systematize it or it it creates a, a culture of responsiveness, then you have positive reports back. I visit some of my charges, mine in particular at at Penn State, Sigma Triton. I walked into the space and females walked up to me and said, I just wanted to let you know, they they didn't tell me to do this. I wanna let you know, this is the one place that I feel safe on campus, like anywhere. If I'm going to socialize, this is the place I want to be. It was something that I cared about as an undergraduate and it was part of our culture. So if we could get institutions, organizations to really focus on going beyond fear and reward, I think we would make huge impacts in in the higher education system. Yeah, that's a really, um, I think, really fascinating take on things. And you're absolutely right. It's don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. You know, not like, well, why would it be wrong to do that? You know, let's think think this out for yourself. And then, well, okay, if you're not going to do that, how else could you have, you know, a really great party that is safe and, and things like that? Um, you know, you brought up the issue of sexual assault and every pretty much, you know, if I have a female college student client, her mom is very concerned about this. Um and they, you know, it's funny because Mark and I were talking about this and they never bring this concern up to him, but they always bring it up to me. And I think there, there's like a gender <laughs> difference there. But every single mom is really concerned about, you know, date rape and sexual assault on campus. Um, you know, what what kind of trends have you seen? How I know it sounds like your organization is really trying to not have that be a part of your culture. But yeah, I. I can't put a finger on sexual assault and um, harassment in it, it, it's what are what are the lessons that we are teaching people like I don't think like I there's a, a book by Alejandro Younger called Clean Gun right and and it's interesting because it we we as a society in healthcare uh, in inside higher education, we treat the symptoms <clears throat> and the symptoms aren't what we should be treating. We should be treating the systems and inside Alejandro Younger's book. There's a, a, a metaphor that he uses about a tree. You know, it's summertime. Trees should be 
growing, flourishing, green. But imagine you're looking outside and you see an unhealthy tree and there's brown leaves underneath it, dead branches. So you call in an arborist and the arborist says, ah, oh, yes, we got a healthy tree. Keep in mind, this arborist is not a real arborist, right? It's quotations arborist. He says, well, what we're going to do, we're going to paint the, the leaves green and we'll staple them to the tree and we'll replace these dead branches by cutting them off and getting a healthy branch from a healthy tree and we'll duct tape it to the tree. Voila, we have a healthy tree. It is absurd, absolutely absurd for us to think that that's the way that it could work, right? But we do that in our society. We treat the symptoms. So I look at, you know, the fraternity as like a pizza, you know, first you got to get your ingredients and then you have to put it through a process, a cooking process. And that's new member education and recruitment, right? If you're not bringing in high quality people with high values and morals, and you're putting them through a process that has high values and morals, you're going to have a mediocre pizza or perhaps even worse than that. So when you're talking about a challenge like sexual assault, what is, what is the quality of the membership that is at that local level? What are the lessons that you are teaching? How are you building them up and not breaking them down? How are you, what I say to the members, and, and this is how we're trying to address uh, the issue because it's again, pervasive across the whole uh, college campus and it is genderized, right? Men are unfortunately at times socialized to be dominant, uh, to be an alpha male, somebody who is more promiscuous. And if we're teaching them through like the awards that you give at a charge meeting or a chapter meeting are the behaviors that people strive to be. And, you know, rather than saying, did you hook up with somebody, you say, did you make a friend today? Right. The way that we frame it, the, the behaviors that we want and expect from one another are the behaviors we're going to get. So inside of the culture, it's like, what is our mindset surrounding relationships with other people? How are we being socially excellent versus socially cool? And if you are socially excellent, by extension, you will be socially cool. Yeah. It's always amazing to me that we don't like motivate and reward and incentivize people for doing the right thing. We punish them for doing the wrong thing, but we never like encourage them to do the right thing as a society. That's always just struck me tremendously. Another thing that moms, of, and this is moms of girls bring up is the Bama Rush documentary that was um, released recently on, I think, HBO Max. Have you seen that at all? No. Yeah. I was just wondering for your critique of that, yeah. if you had... <laughs> I, I know that sorority rush is uh, a monster in itself. And many people, uh, I, I believe, would love to change the system uh, because it's it's really challenging because there's a social tier system in Greek life that I, I really wholeheartedly reject. And I again, if you're well adjusted to a profoundly sick society, that doesn't make you good. Uh, and, and I think that there's a competition theme in America that people compete to be the best. And I think that in itself is also unhealthy, right? We need to think beyond just competition. There's healthy competition, but collaboration is another thing. And if I were to say, we could really increase the number of Greek students inside uh, of the community if we focused on collaboration rather than uh, there's a term they call dirty rush. I was just, I'm wearing a Wabash shirt. I was given to it. Uh, it was given to me by the Dean of Students there, uh, Mark Walsh and I, or Mark Welch, sorry. I went there and I did a recruitment seminar for the entire Greek community at Wabash College. It's an all men's college. And I really talked about, if you're talking bad about each other, then you're disincentivizing people to join Greek life in general. And you just need to say, 
I really think you would be a good fit for this organization. And if you don't like our organization, that's fine. Just go Greek. And if we started working together rather than against one another, we would have tremendous growth. And we would do a non-hostile takeover of every institution that we're a part of. And we would be the leaders that we were designed to be. But here we are. (laughs) <laughs> and in terms of like the tier system, I think um, I know people have looked at GreekRank.com and my daughter was rushing sororities, um, you know, and I I was like, she's like, well, this is, a, you know, the tops. Of the, I'm like, well, how can you rank groups of people like they're not even, you, you know, they're not like quantitative. They're groups of people, you know, like I could see one, they, one sorority having more of your people than another. You know, and I never did understand Greek rank um, in that particular aspect. But what, what are your thoughts about that? I prefer to tell our members to stay away from it. Don't pay attention to it because there are some things that really generate the idea of doing the more socially crazy things. Uh, bar stool, uh, Greek, Greek rank, all, all of those are just falling in and causing our members to to follow a stereotype of what is expected from fraternities. And I think we need to fundamentally shift from that and, and stay away from those rankings and don't pay attention to them. Focus on doing great things, getting involved with student organizations and being the leaders on the campus. You know, I, I keep telling our guys, imagine if you had president of student government, president of ISC, chief editor of the newspaper, and a captain of a club sports team. Where would you be in recruitment? Who would want to join? And how would recruitment look like? If you're focusing on Greek rank, um, you're you're just falling into the pitfalls of what's expected of you in a different way. When my daughter um, did, you know, rush at some point, she just gave up on that as well because she found there was a group of girls that she really liked. Um, they were really helpful. Um, you know, some of them were in her major. They were telling her, you know, which teachers to take. And, and just she felt like she really connected with them. And at that point, she just abandoned that. And that's where, um, you know, she ultimately chose to join. So I, I do think that's right. But it's amazing how <clears throat> much people use that, you know. So one of her friends goes to the University of Illinois. And he was telling me, oh, you know, this girl from like our high school, she's in the top ranked sorority. You know, as if this somehow means, I don't know, I don't know what it means, but it was impressive to him. And, you know, that just, that's, I guess, one of those societal problems that is not just about Greek life. We have to keep up with the Joneses, as they say. (laughs) You know, I was just curious how um, your organization is handling you know, like some of the changes in our society, for instance, you know, trans members, are they welcome in the fraternity um, and and things like that? That is an amazing question. And I think that's something that we've been trying to have conversations with uh, at the international level. For the past three conventions, we've had uh, conversations surrounding gender inclusive recruitment and you know it's it's amazing because our organization we believe in local autonomy so we want people to be able to do what they think is necessary for sustainability for themselves and that's a that's a a really really hard topic in in because there's there's so many diverse opinions around it I'm uh, I'm interested in allowing people always to have a voice to advocate for what they believe in, right? And I think that's that's my job. So I want to create a platform for people to advocate for themselves. And you'll see on the spectrum, you know, you have people. Uh, I'm trying to remember if it was Byron Katie or what uh, author said that maybe it was Susie Orman believed that men should have their own space, right? Everybody should have their own space. If they choose to have their own space, right? Everybody is entitled to have their own space. Women are entitled to have their own space. Minority groups are uh, able to have their own space. Depending on your sexual orientation, you deserve your own space. 
but also there should be spaces where everybody could be and everybody is welcome. So I can't, we are a single sex organization, but that single sex organization is also defined upon, you know, the written rule as well. So if it says, you know, you have to identify as male at time of initiation, it doesn't, doesn't preclude somebody that identifies as male to not be a part of the organization. So it's, it's a really beautiful question, Lisa, and it's such one, it's a wicked problem for many organizations. And we're looking at ways we've explored ways in which that could be possible. And we'll continue to have that conversation as long as we do it with delicacy and kindness towards one another. I think eventually we'll, we'll come to the right decision on what's best for the organization. So to answer your question in a very, very long way, um, I always want to have that conversation. I don't want to shy away from it. Mm -hmm. And I let the organization choose. Yeah, you know, it's hard, though, I think, because, of course, you're absolutely right. You know, people need spaces, you know, like affiliative spaces, right? Affinity groups. But then on the other hand, we also know that people like avoid things that make them uncomfortable. Um, you know, and so if they, you know, if, if I guess cisgender men don't hang out a lot with, with trans men, they won't ever learn to feel comfortable with them. So, and, and so I don't know, I'm not sure like, is the fraternity the right space to do that or not? But I was just sort of wondering, you know, how that works. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's beautiful. And I always encourage people to have social experiences that expose to them to the greatest level of diversity and authenticity of who you can be, right? There are a lot of uh, members that join fraternities that are, are LGBTQ. Uh, and and they need to feel like they can be their authentic selves in every moment. And they don't, I, I feel that that's, that's the most important thing is to allow people to be their authentic selves in their spaces. And, you know, roughly about 81% of our non-white members and 87% of our white members believe that they can be their authentic selves. Now that's not a hundred percent, but the only place that I feel I could be my authentic self at all times is inside the fraternity. So it, that's why it's like, well, can you be yourself if you feel uh, gender inclusive is, is there because women um, or people that may identify as women, you know, may change the dynamic ever so slightly. And what does that look like? So it's, it's not, it's it's a great conversation to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's complicated. Friends, this concludes part two of Lisa's interview with Brian Burchess. Hope you'll join us next week for the final part. On Thursday's episode, Vince is back and in the saddle. And we're talking about an article called Colleges Spend Like There's No Tomorrow. These places are just devouring money. It's in the Wall Street Journal. And it appeared on August 10th of this year. And there are three writers on the byline, Melissa Korn, Andrea Fuller, and Jennifer Forsyth. Our question from a listener comes from a college counselor, Ashley in Independence, Missouri. And she wants to know, who do you follow up with once you've students have graduated and they're off to college? And how do you follow up with these students? And do you have any tips for me? about how I should be following up with students that have left our high school and they're currently in college. And Lisa, being from Missouri, had to take this question. So Lisa joins me to answer that question. Our interview will be the fourth and final part of Julie and I interviewing Lee Coffin, the Vice Provost of Enrollment at Dartmouth College. And Lee's taking tough questions about college admissions. And if you like the Lee Coffin series, and we've been having great feedback, the next three weeks, Lee will be doing a deep dive for us on Dartmouth College. And Kevin is back one more time. Kevin Newton, our international admissions expert. And we're talking about going to a law school in another country. What you need to know. And friends, remember, college is a match to be made and not a prize to be one.
Now go find your college match. See you on Thursday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Matvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stylianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404 404- 664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.